My name is Ivan Rusin. I'm from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I'm a member of this uh, committee, and on behalf of the organizing committee and the entire larger uh, committee and our sponsors, I'd like to welcome you to the session two of this workshop. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the uh, working committee that put this workshop together. And this particular session is, we felt, you know, was something that will really put, hopefully, some meat on the bones. And I was personally very uh, glad that we've uh, heard from our morning speakers today that they are really interested in the hazard part uh, rather than exposure part. And that's exactly what this next session is going to uh, be about. It's what tools do we have going from computational to some of the in vitro screening to in vivo medium and high throughput screening that we can deliver to the industry so they can start making more informed choices in their chemical selection process. Uh, so we have the session being going before and after lunch, and I would like to ask the speakers to stay on time. Uh, please remember that you have 25 minutes for your talk, not 30, so we would like to have some question and answers for each individual talk. We will have the uh, moderated panel later on today, but uh, I think there is a tremendous value in letting people ask burning questions to speakers right after their talks. So I'll stand up at 20 minute mark and uh, I'll ask you to stay on time. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Robert Tengue uh, from Oregon State University. Uh, Robert uh, is uh, one of the uh, people that are really pushing the envelope on high and medium throughput testing in alternative in vivo models and zebrafish. So, Robert, looking forward to your talk. Okay, everybody hear me okay? I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to describe some of the things that we've been doing in the last, I don't know, 15 years or so to to really establish zebrafish as a, uh, as a model for hazard identification in this, in this context. So what, what I, uh, Richard asked me to talk about, not just to plug the zebrafish model, but rather conceptually, why is it potentially very valuable for green chemists to have in vivo data right now? So I've been hearing a lot of um, uh, approaches where we're using uh, bioinformatics or biocomputing as the first step to then prioritize testing. And I'm going to argue that there may be another way to do that uh, based on the, the approaches that we're taking. Okay, challenges and opportunities. Uh, the opportunities to integrate uh, recent advances in toxicology, we're going to hear from, from my talk and also certainly from uh, David uh, next. Uh, traditional whole animal-based studies actually have presented barriers to green chemists. Green chemists, as we heard earlier from Helen, we have data gaps. If, if all of our data for making decisions on whether a compound is, is hazardous or not is going to come from a rodent model, we're going to have data gaps. Um, so again, some of these data gaps result from, from having the, um, uh, the low throughput uh, the low throughput and the expense of these models. So I, I would argue that we need more rapid, be able to more rapidly identify hazard and, and mechanism of, of toxicity. It's not just enough to identify that a compound is toxic, but if we actually had value in the decision tree and knowing why or how the chemical is toxic, that's much more valuable. Um, we certainly need to develop uh, predictive models to proactively, de proactively design inherently safer materials. So design, benign by design, as we heard early this morning. And I do think uh, collectively the field that is using uh, non-mammalian models have really new, dramatically new ways to, to uh, proceed in this regard. So uh, another way of looking at the, the uh, green principles, principles of green chemistry is as, uh, certainly there's 12 principles. And, and what the green chemists need, and we heard it stated very nicely this morning, is they need more data. They need the data faster. They need interactive, more interaction with toxicologists. So, and the way you look at it in terms of the, um, uh, the, where toxicology data is critical is identifying whether a compound is hazardous or not. We heard about that this morning. Uh, design a safer chemicals. In order to design a safer chemical, you need to know what a safe chemical is from a non-safe chemical. Uh, safer solvents, et cetera. So there's very tangible areas where this data is needed and it's needed now to make uh, decisions to promote green chemistry. So I'm going to uh, 
borrowed a few slides from uh, the, the talks testing for the 21st century just to, to kind of remind us of where we're going. So conceptually, we really want to get to the point where we can use high throughput uh, decisions and understand molecular mechanism to really uh, identify what compounds are, are uh, uh, hazardous or dangerous or not. And we're right now we're, you know, we have we're data gaps everywhere. So if we're going to depend on, on human data as projected in the publication, the one to three compounds per year are assessed. You can do hundreds of thousands of compounds using molecular modeling or bioinformatics. And certainly we're somewhere in between right now. So what, how can these other models be useful? So rodent models, I talked earlier about being uh, slow and costly. Uh, some of the non-mammalian models I'm going to talk about today, uh, Drosophila, uh, C. elegans, and zebrafish. Um, I modified this to be more in the tune of a thousand, thousands of compounds a day can be evaluated in this model pretty readily. Um, and certainly cell-based systems and, and other assays. So again, we all recognize that the closer you get to a human, the more relevant it is to humans. And the farther you get away from humans, the slower it is. So we're, what I'm going to argue today is that promoting some of these models early in the decision making may add a lot of new data uh, for green chemists to make decisions on what compounds to use or not. Um, and just conceptually, I think it's important we all realize this, that if you imagine we're only going to talk about hazard identification in this talk, but we realize that in order to have an effect, you have to have an exposure. So in this continuum from exposure to uh, a tissue dose, an immediate effective dose, there's an early response, there's a late response, and then ultimately for a compound that is toxic or hazardous, there's a pathology or disease. So this field of toxicology has been focused down here for decades. I think we all re realize that uh, just conceptually, I think we're all <laughs> mature enough now to realize that all of these uh, diseases occurred from events that happened before that. And now we have the tools to actually look for them. So we're trying to identify these early responses that are predictive of disease and, and uh, uh, outcome. But so again, if we look earlier responses that predict these effects, then now this could be our assay, right? We could, we could develop assays that are focused on early responses. I think the problem we have still, I would argue, is that um, many of the assays that we're developing now are not phenotypically anchored. So when I, what I mean by that, so say this was a, a mammalian model where you, you had control over exposure, the dose, and you had molecular response data, and you had a disease associated with it. You could work back and forth between what responses is associated with the disease. If you just went to an early response, it's not anchored to an effect. And so there, there could be a problem there. I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. So again, of course, what underlies all of this is we realize that there's a biological inputs and there's a series of networks and the computational biologists in the room, they think this way all the time. There are thousands, tens of thousands, millions of interactions in an individual cell that leads to a normal biological function. So the, the conceptually, the idea of how, how does a chemical, how can a chemical disrupt normal biology, the idea is that it interacts with these networks in some ways. And, and so you imagine at a low dose, it, it potentially hits a target, and, and really nothing happens. It's not a high enough dose to perturb the system enough. There's no effect. At a higher dose, you may hit the target a little harder. There's an adaptive response. The cellular responses occur, but there isn't associated with any disease or adverse outcome. And then, again, conceptually, at, the, at yet, um, a higher dose, yet you overwhelm, you hit the same target, you overwhelm the response, there's ultimate injury, and then a toxic outcome. So, so what, I, what we like to think about is in terms of the entry point for your chemical to this complex biological network, uh, the academy called this the, uh, the toxicity pathway, so I prefer tox entry point. Um, there's some, some uh, assumptions made with this model. First of all, it assumes that at the high, low, and medium concentration that the targets are always the same. It also implies that for a chemical, chemo, given chemical, there's only a single biological target. I, I, am, I bring this up because this could be problematic if you start developing individual assays for a known uh, uh, potential mode of action. So this, this becomes important when I talk about the whole animal studies. I, I won't, I won't uh, repeat this definition, but I think we all agree we need to identify toxicity pathways. If we knew all the ways at which a chemical could perturb biology, then we could develop assays uh, to test around it. We do not know them yet. Uh, we can determine if a chemical or a nanoparticle perturbs these pathways. 
and then eventually develop predictive quantitative relationships between the molecular response and again the outcome, the disease. Okay, so how, would you, how do we do biological, biological assessments? We want to get this data to uh, green chemists who are making decisions uh, on, on the, in the real world. So in vitro systems, as we'll hear in the next talk, they're very rapid. They can be cost effective. Again, they can be continuous cell cultures. They can be primary cell culture, uh, stem cells, et cetera. Or you can use in vivo assessments, which are traditionally slow, costly, and these are done primarily in rodents, and I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, fish, flies, and worms today. And how could these in vivo models be uh, uh, informative for uh, green chemistry? All right, so I'm, I'm going to first talk about some of the limitations. I think most recognize these. The main limitation of cell-based systems is their general lack of complexity. Cells are amazingly complex, but they are yet still cells. So if you ask a cell, if you expose a cell with something, and you ask the cell to tell you something of what happened, it can do things like it can proliferate, it could die, it could change its metabolism, it could change its gene expression, its proteome. There could be a, a, a phenotypic uh, change. That's really all a cell, in general sense, can tell you. And so therefore, I, we, I call these uh, blind spots. These are they're fantastic assays that have been developed, but I think in terms of tier one testing, I, I have concerns that they lack complexity. We may miss some things. So what are the blind spots? First of all, the different cell-cell interactions obviously cannot be easily evaluated in cells and culture. The indirect effects cannot be evaluated. What's the endocrine system look like in a cell? A tough one to conceptualize. Um, Cells and culture can only respond using their unique repertoire of expressed gene products. Therefore, they're limited targets. If a gene product, if a target for a toxicant is not expressed in your cell, that cell cannot respond. Practical problems then result. What cells do you choose? What assays do you choose? Are the assays that you choose informative? Are those assays predictive? And again, there's tremendous, tremendous potential for missed data. So I do think rapid in vivo methods may help. So again, I think we need to pick up the pace. And again, I want to remind you that I, I don't believe that high throughput necessarily means high content. So again, if an assay is developed for a specific response, so out of the gate, you're assaying for something that interferes with apoptosis. That's all you're going to get, because that's what your assay has been developed for. Uh, so then you, uh, you're limited uh, data by the assay that you develop. Uh, proliferation, et cetera. So, how, so what's different about doing it in, in vivo? So data interpretation. So uh, we, we uh, uh, deal with this all the time as well. So for example, if you put cells in culture, expose them, and collect some omics data, you, get a, a, you observe a very robust gene expression change following the exposure. And in fact, I, I would like to talk to others about this. It's actually very difficult to have a benign response from an exposure. If you're only looking at omics data, I, I, and we have a lot of experience doing this in vivo, even for compounds that do not produce an adverse effect, we get a very robust genomic response. So, uh, so again, the gene expressions that you get from a given exposure, if, they, if you don't have them related to a phenotype, how, what, what do the gene expressions mean? Are they adaptive or are they predictive of, of something else? So what decisions can be made based solely on omics data? And then what would trigger a concern? And I'm just saying this, this is state of the knowledge now. When I, certainly, I completely, completely agree with the goals of the TOX21. I, I really strongly supportive of the computational initiatives undergoing at the EPA and others, other places. But I think there may be ways that we can accelerate the, the success of the in vitro approaches by uh, anchoring some uh, data phenotypically in vivo. So again, I'm going to argue that we need phenotypic anchors uh, right now in order to make uh, the associations between a molecular response and a disease outcome. So why do we want to use animal studies? <clears throat> well, first of all, there's some certain criteria that, that I uh, share with you. First of all, you would like your... Um, in, in vivo models, again, for a human perspective, you want your in vivo models to share some developmental, anatomical, and physiological characteristic with mammals. And certainly, I'm, I don't have a lot of time today, but certainly in the order of um, 
more similarity, fish more than flies, more than worms. So the closer you get to uh, fish, the closer you are to humans. Uh, you need to have, cons obviously, conserved molecular signaling and networks. If the whole basis of using non-mammalian models is that the mechanisms by which a chemical can perturb biology are conserved, then you better be working with a system that has con conservation. You must have inherent technical advantages of cell culture. And again, so the motto in, in my group is actually, you know, faster, better, cheaper in, in, in everything that we do. It has to be amenable to high throughput phenotypic and behavioral screens. Again, more sensitivity and must be amenable to rapid whole animal mechanistic evaluations. Again, ident identifying not just that a compound is toxic, but if you can use these models to e exactly understand why a chemical is toxic. Because if you really step back and you ask the question, of all the chemicals that we've studied, that we've been studying for decades in the field of toxicology, how many mechanisms of action do we really know? We say that a lot. But in terms of the number of compounds that we absolutely today could say this compound caused this effect because of this mechanism is, is frighteningly limited. So, so, so keep, keep that in, in mind. Um, so again, having, having genome sequence, having the ability of transgenics, mutants, and genetic and chemical screens all in place, and that you can unleash to connect cause and effect is really what we're going after. So again, I'm going to talk briefly about C. elegans, Drosophila, and zebrafish and some of the criteria that need to be present in order to really promote these models for uh, green chemistry is they need to be quick, the genomes need to be sequenced, they have phenotypic screens, behavioral screens, and automation has already been not just conceived but implemented, and all of these have occurred, and it just to give you a sense of scale, C. elegans are a fantastic model. Uh, development to maturity is less than three days, Drosophila less than two weeks, and zebrafish is about two months. So, so these models, they are, these are not just conceptually can be used for high throughput screening, they are actually being used for high throughput screening. Okay, so again, this is a systems approach, a systems biology approach. So, so I'm arguing that there's an advantage of doing phenotypic based screens in vivo in general. And then I'm gonna say there's a life period, a life stage which is even better than just being in vivo. And that would be early embryonic development. So again, why embryonic development? We all recognize that most compounds are more uh, toxic or they're more responsive during early life stages. And, and the interpretation really is because this is the most dynamic life period in an organism's uh, life. All the genes of a genome are used during development. And therefore, all of the targets that could be targets, all of the, the molecules that could be targets for a chemical are present at some point during development. So again, if you're talking C. elegans, you're just talking a few uh, well, hours and, and uh, uh, flies and fish, we're talking uh, uh, days. Therefore, there are fewer blind spots. If the whole goal in this context of this meeting is to identify the uh, compounds that have the ability to interact with and disrupt biology, the best time to do it would be when all those gene products are present. There, so the other extension is if a chemical or nanomaterial is developmentally toxic, it absolutely must influence the activity of a molecular pathway or a process, i.e. hit or influence the toxicity pathway. There's no other way. You can't have a compound cause and effect if it didn't hit something. So if you can use a whole animal uh, uh, model to identify the response and work yourself back where you can identify the effect. So again, use the, the response as a, as a path. So again, high content, high throughput platforms can be helpful. Again, if we, instead of just doing um, structure response relationships, if we have a phenotypic based structure activity relationships. Again, so what I like to say in my lab is, and certainly other places is uh, don't run from the complexity of the biology. So we know that developmental biology is tremendously complex and in ways that we can only imagine the billions of interactions that are happening in order to, to build an animal. Take advantage of it as a very sensitive way to have a, to probe chemical biolog biological interaction. So again, identification of a toxicity pathway using the whole animal response as your first uh, path. So, could you click on this? Um, so this just, just give me an example of, I'm gonna turn my attention to zebrafish, because that's what I do. Um, this just shows you a, a, an image, a video that we uh, started at four hours post-fertilization. And you can see this is in real time 
uh, time lapse to 17 hours of development. You can see how rapidly this guy is developing. The, the eye is, is developing here. The brain is this area. You see the somites forming, and this is where the, the tail will generate. So this is just the yolk in the middle. So, the, so this, all of the events, just imagine the, the millions and millions of events that had to occur for those cells to move, differentiate, and bump into the other cell, change that cell, what it's doing. All of these could be potentially probed by a chemical. So there's multiple levels of interrogation. And most of our assays that, that we describe for the context of this talk are, are completed within five days. So, so again, what we're doing, we're challenging this unbelievably complex system as soon as possible. So we want to get the chemicals in right out of the gate, right when all the events are starting to occur. And we know that embryonic develop, so therefore embryonic development can just be a sensor. So you basically, you, you, when you have the chemicals present, when this animal is developing, you're, you're telling the animal, I challenge you to develop normally, even though you've been bathed in this chemical. And most chemicals that we've evaluated, that's exactly what happens. Most chemicals are not developmentally toxic. So again, we look for any differences related following the exposure. So we're not biased. The animal has everything it can do and everything it ex expressed from it, the way it looks and the way it develops, the way it, it behaves to stimuli, its central nervous system uh, function. And we just ask the question, following this very defined exposure, is everything OK? And use that as, as very rapid information that we can feed back to people who are interested in the information. So the more, the more we measure, the more assays we develop, the more ways that we can probe this biology, the more sensitive this assay is and more informative the, 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 the data will be to make decisions. So just to, again, to remind you how, so all of our exposures, we start them very early, six hours post-fertilization, and we, we end them at, at 120 hours. So you can just, you can imagine how many things had to happen in this organism from here to here. From not have, from just being a collection of cells to having an animal with a, a, a beating heart, an endocrine system, a liver, an immune system, et cetera. So again, just to show you how we do it in our labs. So again, some nuances that I, I think are important to bring up in the context of this uh, talk is uh, we actually remove the chorions very early in development. The chorion is this uh, protective barrier. This chorion absolutely, for some compounds, is a barrier for exposure. So again, if we're asking, we don't want blind spots, we, we want to force an interaction between our chemical and this biology. We don't want anything in the way. Uh, we put one embryo per well, 96 or 384 well plates. We have multiple replications, multiple concentrations. Uh, we have uh, rigorous QA, QC. We have negative controls and, and positive controls in every plate. These test materials could be large chemical libraries. We've done tens of thousands of compounds. They could be small libraries of, uh, say, a company that has lead compounds of 50 compounds, and they just want to pick one. We could run all of them and then say, well, you know what? This one's pretty good, and these I'd stay away from. So we do this um, all the time. Um, the high content endpoint, just to get an idea, what do we look for? So these are things that can be done uh, fairly easily. We're looking for changes in the way the animal looks uh, in terms of its, its uh, morphology. How's, how's the heart developing, the body axis, et cetera? Is the circulation normal? Is the heart rate normal? Is it progressing through development? Are all those molecular events occurring as, as designed? Uh, we certainly do have a number of uh, omics endpoints. Uh, we've been adding many, many more behavioral uh, uh, assays to ask the questions with very low levels of exposure. Are there subtle effects on the ability of the animal to respond to touch or respond to light, dark stimula stimulation or effects on their learning and memory? So these are all um, on board as well. Uh, just a couple concepts that are important. When you start using non-mammalian models, you have to think a little differently. And I brought this point up before. This is an example of very common signs of toxicity in fish. And some, another example of, of compounds that are affecting the way the notochord develops compared to the control. Again, these are all phenotypic screens. You can look down and, and see these. Um, in vivo cell death assays with increasing concentrations of the compound, the, the bright spots tells you that the cells are dying. This is a live animal under, undergoing this assay. You can just simply do gene expression changes and ask whether a chemical is affecting the expression of a gene. Um, the most important point is you have to, and again, I brought this up before, you have to consider start points, not end points. You don't, you don't use non-mammalian models and try to take an effect in a fish and translate that effect on a, on a human. Instead, you want to understand the activity of the compound. 
the compound hit something in a fish to cause an adverse outcome. Molecular signaling is conserved, therefore that target is conserved in humans, so it's a potential as a hazardous compound. So again, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not uh, fish, flies, and worms. So the consequences of disrupting signaling often is species specific. So the mechanism by which a target is hit is conserved, but the consequence is different. So we may have a compound that affects the fin formation in a fish, and they may hit a, a collagenase gene that would have a different effect in humans. So you can't get too hung up on endpoints. So again, interpreting these, we've screened uh, tens of thousands of compounds and, and certainly mutants, and we see a lot of these endpoints, a very, very common at the five-day assay endpoint. Common does not mean nonspecific. And what I mean by that, so this is one example, if we, we study a, a series of compounds that affect the, the, the animal through the aerial hydrocarbon receptor, so dioxin is a good example. We now know, and others certainly know, that most of the effects of dioxin are require, require the H receptor in order to cause effects. So what we can do, just to demonstrate this, we've done this with a number of other compounds, is when the H receptor aren't complex are present, exposed to a ligand, five days later this animal dies. It has a complete system failure. You bathe these guys in the same amount of compound, but you knock out either aren't or the H receptor, these animals are completely fine. So these common endpoints have a very specific initiation. The entry point, the toxicity pathway would be the H receptor in this case. Uh, automation, again, so automation has actually been implemented in flies, worms, and certainly fish. So it's actually, this is not conceptual. These uh, many labs have uh, accomplished this now. So I'm just gonna show you a couple things from, from our group that in terms of automating our embryo production, our embryo handling, et cetera. So some of the things that we had to do is uh, certainly we had to change the way you reproduce uh, eggs. So we have a large tank room, individual small tanks that we have tens of thousands of fish. We actually created a new way of, of producing tens of thousands, if not millions of fish in, in, in a month. So we actually raise our fish now in very large tanks in batches of of two to 3,000 fish and collect tens of thousands of eggs every morning. So this is just one of the rooms. Uh, some of the other automation that's uh, in place. Let you start this. This is a, our second generation uh, robot. Actually, it's a vision-based system that's actually picking up dechlorinated embryos when they're only six hours of, of age, which is actually not uh, trivial. So right now, the, the, we have a bank of these guys, so we can fill a 96 well plate in about 12 minutes. I'll just show you real quick that some of the things that you had to consider. The embryos that, without the chorions, are extremely sensitive uh, to uh, manipulation. So this just kind of shows how the, the probe picks it up. And you can see, real, you can see it actually pulls it, pulls it way up to high, and then, we, then there's gravity that allows it to settle to the tip, and then we time it perfectly so that when they drops in the 96 well plate, there's no liquid delivery. So, so this actually tremendously helped our throughput. And, and, and finally, we've actually developed a number of um, automated imaging uh, systems to automatically screen whether or not the animal is normal or not. So now our last challenge is, and, and we definitely need help in this area, and, um, is the data sharing. So we have many, many collaborations that have millions and millions of data points and we haven't found a very effective way to share the data to others who could use it to make maybe their decisions. So I do think we need uh, knowledge bases, pr pr particularly for this whole animal informatics, which is not very well developed. And certainly, as mentioned earlier, the data visualization tools uh, are really needed to, to help not only us make decisions, but also uh, uh, green chemists. Take home messages, I think non-mammalian models offer a number of powerful advantages. Throughput is not an issue anymore. Uh, I think the model is best applied to identify hazard and toxicity mechanisms, and again, to drive green chemistry choices, but not directly for risk assessment, so don't put that requirement on these models. Certainly, managing uncertainties of false negatives and false positives that needs to be dealt with. Certainly, differences in ADME is an issue. Uh, no maternal contribution during exposure, we have to consider that. Uh, molecular signaling functionally is well conserved, but the primary sequence may not be. So the H receptor in fish is present as, as it is in humans, but there are subtle differences in the sequence. So that could uh, influence some of the response data. All right, with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thanks.
while we line up people to the microphones, let me open up with the first question. So uh, do you have uh, an idea of how predictive these assays and the data from these assays are against, for example, you know, to your cancer bioassay or some other in vivo endpoints that are available from animal or human experiments? Have you taken some of your data and actually tried to correlate or compare that to in vivo toxicity? Yeah, so the, the validation question, um, we have not had the, the tools or the resources to make that a goal. To, to take known uh, human carcinogens, certainly not. But human teratogens, the predictivity is, is quite good. Um, so, so I think we, we need to have uh, really concerted collaborative efforts where we have a common data set to ask those types of questions. Uh, Helmut Zarbel, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Yeah. Um, nice talk. I was just wondering, and you kind of alluded to, uh, to it at the end of your talk, are there plans to <clears throat> sorry, actually humanize um, the fish with respect to human metabolism and, and so on? Uh, that's, there's been uh, efforts to you know, bioactivate uh, uh, compounds. I, actually, I, I'm actually not a fan of that. Um, what I would rather do is the folks who are really good at doing human metabolism and predictions of human metabolism, I'd like them to make the compounds for us. And then we would screen all the potential metabolites. So we're doing that for some, so the, 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 some of the pH work that we're doing. We're going through libraries of a couple hundred uh, pHs and their metabolites and, and doing them one at a time. So we're kind of taking advantage of the throughput rather than um, the complexities of trying to humanize another organism. I think that, yeah, but it's a great question though. Enjoyed your talk, Robert. Yeah. So I completely agree that the signal Signal transduction pathways are really highly conserved and very finite in number, but the receptors are not highly conserved, Agreed. nor are the metabolism right. pathways. And my question for you, since you've looked at so much of this data, is how much does that matter? Yeah. I mean, really, it's, it's this question of, you know, how many of these things are really high af high affinity enough that it that it matters? Yeah. And and I and I've kind of been wringing my hands about that question and would, would love to know, since you've looked at so many chemicals, what your yeah, opinion it's is. Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, some of it you can get at, George, by looking at the, the concentration um, range. So, and this kind of gets to your validation question as well. So when we start hitting libraries of compounds with known, mo known modes of action in, in mammals, and some of them we may have to, we may see the response only at a higher concentration. So that may be the lower affinity. Um, I don't think it's as big a concern as we think. Uh, I think there's certainly going to be cases, you know, a false, false negatives are going to occur from this model. So we're clearly not ready to just jump into any model, one model system and make a final decision. But I think we really need a concerted effort of, of libraries of materials. Jim, and I, Jim Hutchinson and I are doing this in, the, in our nano realm where we actually have libraries of materials and we're trying to evaluate them across other platforms to see how well they validate. I think the same is needed um, for, for chemicals, like the tox cast uh, uh, compounds that we're going to be evaluating, for example. But I don't think it's as big a problem as we think it could be. Robert, nice talk. Mark Thompson, DuPont. Uh, just a question about your um, automated imaging. You, yeah. have, you have a number of phenotypic effects there, some of which seem fairly subtle. Yeah. And you said a couple of times throughput is no longer an issue, but uh, one of the challenges we had in yeah. developing miniaturized in vivo high throughput assays yep. was making sure the Kind of those effects were so simple that yeah. we could. Uh, have you really automated um, all of those? A lot of them. Yeah. So, okay. so there's always a challenge. You know, the human eye is much, much better than any uh, machine learning that that can be developed. But in some cases, it's it's um, the way we construct our assay is we we let the animals, eh, bad term, but decompose to a very uh, bad extent. So the so the hit the hit is revealed by some obvious effect. And then it makes you come back and take a closer look maybe a little earlier and see more subtle effect, and that would be human, humanated. But some, most of the endpoints that we list here are, have all been automated completely. Just yeah. quickly, maybe last question. Yeah, uh, Chris Volpe from UC Berkeley. Um, so the focus here has been largely on mammalian toxicity, and you know, mammals are great. Um, but you know, it also seems that we have a, a uh, interest in green chemistry in yeah. impact on ecosystems right. and environmental uh, uh, endpoints. And to my mind, it's, you know, although this, you've, you're making a good case for its use in mammalian t toxicology, I wonder whether, you know, using these approaches um, would be you know, useful for ecosystem endpoints and, you know, perhaps 
we yeah. need equal focus on the ecosystem endpoints as on the mammalian endpoints. Yeah. And I guess I just wanted to make yeah. that point and I, I, I agree. I think that. the approaches are exactly the same, right? It's the, sometimes the data will be used a little bit differently. So if you're going to do a, a, an ecosystem impact, you might want to look at what impact it has on the individual organism in the, in the, in the ecosystem. But the approaches would be exactly the same. You can't have an effect on an organ in an ecosystem without having a hitting a toxicity pathway in an individual organism. So yeah, I agree. It, these all can be applied. And, and they are. Thank you very much, Robert. <laughs> well, our next speaker is Dr. David Dix, uh, Deputy Director of the National Center for Computational Toxicology at uh, EPA in Research Triangle Park. And David's clearly in the trenches, as we already heard from uh, Dr. Anastas this morning. And uh, not only NCCT is testing chemicals, but is also you know, trying to use that information for decision making. So we're looking forward to a talk, David. Thanks, Yvonne. The other organizers, the committee. Let me go ahead and get ready for the scratchy throat that'll come in about 10 to 20 minutes. But I'll be done in 25. So. Right? Anyway, um, it's really, I, ha I haven't seen Robert present in a while, and it's really fun to follow after him and um, some of the other speakers. I think this has been a good session already that really sets us up. So let's see if I can figure out my path forward. Not that. Ah, yeah, 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 the computer's over here. Okay, so is it the top button? I think I got it. Oh, no. Forward, back. Okay. Okay. And then I can blast you with a laser with the center button, right? <laughs> Where is the laser? There's the laser. No. Sorry about that. The laser is which one? The top? No. Oh, that little one. The very low, this one. Yeah. All right. Good. Training's over. Okay. Try this one more time. Yes. Okay. So this is a, it's the same setup that Robert did and just a slightly different, more visual approach. So why are we doing comp, why are we messing around with computational toxicology or in this case, ToxCast and Tox21, high throughput approaches? And the simple answer is there's way too many chemicals and way too little data. And this is a visual um, presentation of information on a variety of different chemicals, classes, chemical programs that are regulated by EPA, industrial chemicals, pesticides, that's what all those acronyms are standing for there. But if you map over from the left to the right, you can see that other than for uh, acute, to acute toxicity here, the majority of chemicals have n no information on cancer, reproductive, or developmental effects. Um, and even gene, gene tox is not that well rep represented. So we're not going to be able to test our way out of this um, situation using traditional approaches. And that's where high throughput approaches come in, um, in combination with computational tools. Taking advantage of robotics, high density well plates, you can do concentration response assays or concentration response testing for specific molecular targets, cellular targets. In ma many cases, human targets, if we're interested in health effects testing, other species, if that's the point of interest, and then map that information back into pathways and start to rebuild Humpty Dumpty to some degree in a systems-based approach. So about five, six, seven years, who's counting? Five, six years ago, we started ToxCast, and then um, in partnership with NTP and the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, Tox21. And we're now at a state where we've tested about 1,000 chemicals through over 600 different high throughput screening assays. And we've taken a subset of those assays that are relevant for potential endocrine activity and tested an additional 1,000, or are testing an additional 1,000, I should say. So we have data back on that first 1,000 chemicals. We have data coming on the second 1,000. And then the big chemical set that's just about ready to launch. The chemical library is just about in place at NCGC, at the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, are the TOX21 chemical library of 10,000 chemicals. Now, that won't be on as many assays as ToxCast. ToxCast, you know, we run 600 assays. TOX21, it'll be an assay or, or 
about an assay every week or two. So maybe 50 assays total over the course of the next several years. But these three approaches will be very complementary and very useful dif for different uh, types of approaches and really create a, a wealth of data that uh, is all publicly available as it becomes qc analyzed, and then put up onto web-based uh, databases. So we took advantage of technologies and resources that were developed for the pharmaceutical industry. Most of the data from ToxCast, for ToxCast, is coming from contract research organizations that, you know, typically run these assays for pharmaceutical for companies and in some cases maybe some chemical companies. We also have a few key collaborators. Um, I'll point out at the Hamner Institutes for Health Sciences, Rusty Thomas and his group, um, funded by the American Chemistry Council primarily is doing some really important work with us on reverse dosimetry. So we can do that important conversion from an in vitro concentration response to an in vivo dose response. Our collaborators internally, specifically in the health and environmental effects research lab, include Stephanie Padilla, who's running the ToxCast chemicals through a zebrafish embryo assay that's really important. And it's not the complete zebrafish answer. There's genetic, um, you know, transgenic zebrafish that will provide more mechanistic information. I think Robert's um, assays, including his behavioral assays, would be very important to, to the cause uh, as well. Um, and then uh, through Tox21, our partners, um, for example, over at NTP are running the ToxCast chemicals through a worm tox assay, a C. elegans assay. So there's a range of different uh, types of in vitro assays going from cell-free biochemical type assays to cell-based assays to small organism, alternative organism type of assays. And as I mentioned, all of this data is being generated in concentration response. I was finding myself taking a little bit of exception this morning with the focus on hazard um, and at the expense, perhaps my perception at the expense of understanding ex dose response and exposure. One of the things we've observed in the zebrafish developmental tox or embryo assay, for example, 75, 80 percent of the chemicals cause effects. So that starts to get difficult to interpret. The point is that they're causing these effects in the zebrafish assay at relatively high concentrations. And it's important to take into account concentration response and then start to map that back to exposure when you're prioritizing chemicals for further analysis. So I, I take a little bit of exception to um, too much of a focus or limiting our focus to hazard screening at the expense of exposure screening. And I think Tina in the back of the room probably would agree with me on that one, right? So this is what uh, the ToxCast Phase 1 in vitro data set looks like in a heat map that we published uh, this past year. And um, it's a combination of results for the 300 Phase 1 chemicals lined up in these 309 rows here across about 500 different assays. And this color ribbon here indicates the different type of assays. And you can see that there's some chemicals that were relatively weak or gave relatively few signals, the red indicating signal or activity. And then there were some assays that were very limited, very specific, maybe only a handful of chemicals that were active. And then there were other chemicals in here or other assays where you saw a lot of activity. So it's just a quick way to visualize across the phase one results. We wanted to make comparisons to the in vivo data, anchoring to um, adverse effects in, in mammalian testing and to help us to build predictive models from the in vitro data for the in vivo effects. But ultimately, our goal is to get beyond the animal toxicity data and to move to understanding effects in human systems um, in relationship to human disease. That's been a big focus early on in ToxCast. I take Chris's point that there is more to the world than just mammals, but a large goal in ToxCast is to be able to predict a chemical's potential to cause human disease. Um, in this case, by its hazard profi profiling and then in combination with ExpoCast, uh, it's a um, combination of hazard and a potential for exposure, so it's risk for human disease. So I wanted to move pretty quickly through kind of the stock introduction of ToxCast. I hope that that was okay for most of you. I think most of you have seen presentations on ToxCast before. I wanted to get to some new data that we've generated in phase two of ToxCast, which 
thanks to some postdocs who worked over the weekend for us, um, I've been able to show you some results for some alternative chemicals that we've tested. So before I do that, I just think I need to do just a couple more preparatory uh, slides. I wanted to introduce the Toxicological Prioritization Index, or ToxPi, which uh, Mark, met, Mark Thompson mentioned. And it's a very similar tool to what DuPont and Mario Chen at DuPont has developed. And it's a visualization and a way to rank the relative activity or the relative score of chemicals uh, across really any type of data you want to include. And so over here on the right, you see a ToxPi that we published last year in, in environmental health perspectives um, with a variety of different assays relevant to endocrine activity, androgen receptor assays, estrogen receptor, thyroid, other exome admi targets, and other nuclear receptors, a few chemical properties related to bioavailability, bioconcentration, and then a mapping of those receptors or these assay targets to a variety of different uh, pathways and disease classes. And so we could look at different chemicals in the relative score one to the other and say that, for example, bisphenol A was one of the, if not most, the most active chemical across the six estrogen receptor assays in that current data set um, relative to tebuthyron, which showed no estrogen receptor activity in those six assays, but did show a, a little bit of a propensity or a, a score that gave it a, at least a little bit of pi, um, not a whole lot, for this total polar surface area log p uh, score, indicating its potential to be uh, bioavailable. But you can see even compared to bisphenol A, it's not as active. So this would be a good example maybe of a low scoring, low ranking, perhaps low um, potential concern chemical versus a chemical that's showing quite a bit of a biological activity in some relevant uh, potential relevant modes of action or mechanisms. Maybe t we could call them toxicity pathways. So that's the ToxPi approach, and you're going to see this used over and over for a variety of different types of models. Um, we could take that phase one data set, the 309 chemicals that we generated the ToxPies and published for in that paper um, from last year, and we can start from the lowest ToxPi score to the highest and look across the chemicals and see up near the top, again, bisphenol A, with, driven by that ER response, and then HPTE and its parent methoxychlor driven by ER, uh, AR and ER responses, and then chemicals in the middle showing different types of activities um, down to the low-ranking tebuthyron and other chemicals. So if you were interested in assessing or predicting or prioritizing chemicals based on potential for en endocrine activity, endocrine hazard, if you will, you could argue that this is a reasonable approach for taking a subset of the toxicast assays, ranking them, visualizing the results, and, and having a, the highest to lowest prioritization for these chemicals, perhaps for any further screening and testing. And that's something the agency is actively working towards as we expand beyond the phase one chemical set to the phase 2,000 and then to the extended EDSP21 set of a second thousand. So we'll have 2,000 chemicals of data over the course of the next fiscal year, and we'll be analyzing it in some fashion similar to this to help the agency prioritize chemicals for further screening and testing. Okay, in the course of planning the presentation, um, I was asked to say a few words about a real world application that ha has come and gone, I'm happy to say it's over with. And that was the Deepwater Horizon oil um, spill from last, just last year, it seems like a long time ago. Um, again, I'm happy to be able to say that. And so I think most of you know that there was close to 2 million gallons of dispersant used in the Gulf of Mexico in response to that oil spill. And because of where we are today in this country in terms of uh, um, what we know about chemicals and how they're regulated, the eight different candidate uh, dispersants had some limited information in terms of their potential biological activity, and that biological activity could be translated into potential for hazard. And so there was a request from the administrator to give, provide more information rapidly on these eight different oil spill dispersants. And so we um, ran them through a subset of the ToxCast assays, as well as other collaborators within the Office of Research and Development who did acute toxicity in fish and invertebrate species. Um, and we looked for, in particular, estrogenicity. That was the real key focus, because some of the dispersant formulations had um, nonophenol ethoxylates, which are known to have some either parent or their degradates 
known to have uh, some estrogenous, estrogenic activity. And so we took those and um, ran them through that subset of toxicast assays. And I'm just going to jump quickly forward. There's the structure of the ethoxylate and nonophenol down there, I believe. And we ran them through these assays. These are the eight different dispersants that we got from a variety of different manufacturers um, in cooperation with the agency. And so we ran these through a variety of different estrogen, androgen receptor assays, and uh, also complementary cytotoxicity assays, which are important for interpreting the results and are useful in and of themselves. So the key here over on the right are uh, the fish assays, the um, brine shrimp assay, I believe it is. So those are these red and uh, gray and black triangles, so the relative acute toxicity in these aquatic species of the eight different dispersants, one, two, three through eight, and then a variety of different endpoints for um, cytotoxicity in the different cell lines that the different nuclear receptor or steroid receptor assays are being run in. And you can see from more potent to less potent, the one corrects at 9500 dispersant that was used in um, large volumes it's kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of cytotoxicity. No really glaring difference between it and any of the other dispersants in terms of the aquatic species acute tox or the mammalian cell cytotox. Um, so that was, that was a good thing. Um, oh, this is not quite the final version that I envisioned, but that's okay. That's one of the reasons I'm skipping s through so many slides. Um, is this the 20 September version? Okay. So what we saw in the um, what we saw in the activity, yeah, I wanted the 21st September. <laughs> so what uh, what we saw in the activity was some very weak relative activity for a couple of the dispersants, none of neither of which were the corrects at 9500. So this is uh, one of the ER alpha estrogen receptor assays. Here's the control estradiol res concentration response curve. And f here's a couple of control NPE, n n uh, ethoxylated nonophenol compounds here and here. And um, the nonophenols itself, especially the branched form, which is the most potent and efficacious. So that's a sort of a control data set. And then if we come down here, and we can see that for one of the dispersants, which Nicomas 3F4, there was a weak activity in one or two of eight different estrogen receptor assays. So very low potency, very low efficacy, and very inconsistent results across these eight different estrogen receptor assays for either this dispersant or this dispersant. And so the interpretation is that while we could, with very sensitive assays, run at very high concentrations, well beyond any even, you know, at least back of the envelope exposure potential, you had, um, you know, very weak activity that probably was not biologically re relevant, let alone relevant to any kind of decision making in the Gulf, and neither of those dispersant formulations were the crux at 9500. So good news all the way around. Um, I guess that's retroactive green chemistry of sorts. Not really. I think I can say that because Paul's not here. Okay. I want to blast past the uh, dispersant data, and we can get back to that if there's questions and if there's time. I want to get to um, talking about um, the bi biological modeling, or the predictive modeling, and the systems modeling work, and some of these initial early results we're seeing on some of the alternative chemicals, alternative plasticizers, and alternatives to perfluorinated chemicals. And so this is just a very rough overview of the bioactivity signature workflow, starting from the ToxCast data. We, take, we look at univariate associations of the in vitro data to the in, in vivo data to select features that we can associate with different adverse outcomes. We build then, with those univariate association identified features, multivariate models using a variety of different machine learning algorithms to build predictive models for developmental toxicity, reproductive toxicity, carcinogenicity, and other specific endpoints. And then, in some cases, we take that, those features of the multivariate, univariate models and build multicellular systems models. In silico simulations, using cell-based agent approaches to 
start to put the molecular components back into in silico cells and to put those in silico cells back together into a, a, um, um, a computational tissue. And so I'll end up showing you some really interesting movies and some of the phenotypic effects um, predicted or simulated from the in vitro data back into an in silico tissue, a virtual tissue, for both conventional and alternative chemicals. So that's where we're going to go over the next slides. Oh, darn. You know, if that's the case, I think, I think I'm going to ask you to do something. That you're not, yeah. I'm going to get you a memory stick. I mean, I can stall while you're doing this, but this is not the right presentation. And I apologize. I know it's not going to get webinared, but I think you can do this on the fly here. Is that right? In terms of what's on the screen? So it's the September 20 version. Okay. Sorry about that. But this, this version does not have what I wanted in it. And once you start sticking these movies in, they get up, the files get very large, so you can't email them. I FTP'd them, and then I brought them on the memory stick, but uh, I didn't do good enough QC this morning to make sure it was the right version. Great. Um, it's so far looking very promising. Yeah, this is the right one. Okay. So we've published a number of different models, three different models that I want to talk about. A reproductive toxicity predictive model, a Martin et al. paper that's cited down in the bottom left of this slide in uh, biology of reproduction this, this year. And um, the features of that model, and, and this is, these are going to be presented as tox pies. So I showed you tox pies. I've given you a, a real, real cursory overview of how we develop these models. And the features of this particular model are indicated down here. I know it's going to be next to impossible for you to see, but it includes androgen receptor, PPAR alpha, a number of other targets or collection of tar aggregated targets, eight different features of this model, about 35 different individual assays comprise those, or aggregated into those eight different features. And this model in both training and test and then in forward validation is in that range of definitely being useful. It's uh, showing about 80% balanced accuracy overall, and in the forward de validation in a relatively small set and a challenging set relative to the training and test data, because it was from uh, the open literature in large part, um, about 75% balanced accuracy. So this is a very good performing model, um, uh, in, in my opinion. And so what I've got here are tox pies used based on those different features for a variety of different conventional and alternative plasticizers. And I'm, you know, we know the identity of these plasticizers. We know their structures, if they are single structure at least. Um, but at this point in time, with where we're at in the data analysis, et cetera, you can probably appreciate that I'm not willing to rip, um, identify what those alternatives are. But up at the top here is bisphenol A, which scores relatively high for potential for reproductive toxicity. Um, TGSA is, I think, an alternative um, that's suggested, has uh, been around for a while and su was suggested, I think, at one point as an alternative to BPA. But I think it's well known to be um, quite active in terms of its uh, relative to steroid receptors, including androgen receptor, which is showing up in this part of the tox pie. Here's PFOS and PFOA, which also show up um, uh, you know, relatively large tox pies. A bunch of other phthalates are here by acronym. Um, let's see, let's find DEHP and MEHP is in there. There's a couple of variants, um, so there's replicate chemicals. In some cases, it's not the exact same chemical, in some cases it's uh, repeat sourced chemical, which is a more challenging type of replicate. But anyway, there's DEHP and DBP, dibutyl phthalate data here, as well as the monoforms of MEHP, the metabolite, uh, the monoester metabolite of DEHP, and uh, MBP, the monoform of uh, MB DBP. And then there's a variety of different alternative plasticizers and alternative perfluorinated chemicals. So 
Let's just look at the perfluorinated chemical here. I think this might be the only one in this particular plot, but I'll show you a bigger one in just a second. And you can see it might not be a simple comparison, a simple analysis to say that this PFA alternative is, uh, represents a lower hazard potential than PFO and PFAS. Um, there's definitely some activity and it's something that you'd want to look at. Now, PFAS is showing uh, uh, quite a bit of activity in some targets, what I would consider some high value targets. Now these are, you know, when I show this type of result and you see this relatively high activity for androgen receptor, for PFAS, people take exception to that. There's a couple things to remember. These are being tested in some of these assays up at 100 micromolar, even 200 micromolar concentrations. So this may have little to no relevance to real world exposures and real world concentrations. And that's something that has to be taken into account as you go deeper into the analysis. But this is a first pass, high throughput screening type of analysis. And so the first point I would make is that it's just not a simple yes, no between PFO, PFOS, and this PFO alternative. You could say the same about a variety of these different phthalates and the plasticize, plasticizer al alternatives. Here's a plastic alt-1 that's showing quite a bit of activity and, uh, relative to you know, MBP and DBP, wherever it's hiding around here. And so it's not in this particular analysis, this particular data, this particular predictive model, it's not necessarily clear that that's a better alternative plasticizer versus conventional phthalates. So let me go on. This is the complete set of about 54 chemicals. Again, this isn't all of the alternative plasticizers and perfluorinate chemicals that we've tested. It's not all the conventional, but it's our initial pull from the data set. And again, they've, we've mapped from the highest rank, the biggest tox pi, down to the lowest. You have a lot of chemicals that show little to no activity down in here, and a lot of those are the alternatives. That's a good thing. But there's quite a bit of variability between, say, plasticizer alternative one versus plasticizer alternative 19 or 18 or several of the others where you see no activity for these particular targets as opposed to activity. And so what I, one of the things this argues to me is that if we have the capacity, we really need to screen alternative chemicals for potential for hazard, for potential for bioactivity. I think that would be very useful information going in to um, not just selecting chemicals for use in products, but also working backwards and start to understand better in terms of how to really have cleaner, greener chemicals by design. How are we doing time-wise? We're at close? Yeah, one minute. Yeah. Okay. So the very similar um, model for developmental toxicity has just been published in Toxicological Sciences. Um, first author is Sipes. And down in the bottom right, here are the features of that particular model. And just some examples of phthalates, DHP, it's MEHP, DBP, and MBP. And again, these pla alternative plasticizers, ranging from something that has quite a bit of ac activity, quite a big slice of tox pi, to something that has absolutely no activity. And so if one were looking at alternatives to either DEHP or DBP from the perspective of developmental toxicity, you might argue that at first pass, this seems to be a better choice than perhaps something over here on the left. And finally, I want to look at the third model. This is a mechanistic model around the pathways that are critical to blood vessel development. It uses a CompuCell 3D cell agent based modeling system so we can bring together the molecular signals into the different cell types that form um, the, develop the developing blood vessels and their different activities of expression, chemotaxis, and proliferation. And this can be plugged into a, let's see if it works, here we go, into a, it's an active in silico simulation of the cell behavior being driven by these different molecular features, these different pathways that are functioning in these different cell types as they form the different blood vessels. So again, the color coding in the middle there, it's flashing as it goes around to the different molecular signals and uh, signaling pathways, and then reverting back to the four different cell types that comprise the developing uh, blood vessels. So quickly, you can then start to generate data on the effect of specific chemicals on those targets, those molecular targets, those molecular signaling pathways stemming from the tox cast assays. 
and <coughs> code those effects, code those, the impact of those effects back into the in silico model. And this is a plot of using uh, thalidomide and 5-HPP33, a thalidomide analog, which is very active uh, anti-angiogenic compound. And in, um, you can get simulations that map or correlate very nicely to what you see in vivo with these three different compounds, or it, with control versus these two control compounds, where you have the most severe disruption of angiogenesis occurring in silico and in vivo uh, in response to the thalidomide analog. Okay, so that sets us up to then look at the results for these particular targets for perfluorinated chemicals, PFOS, PFOA, and you can see that some of the alternatives are very um, inactive across these different assays. These are human primary co-culture system assays that provide us the molecular end tar target data that we can then map into that in silico cell model. The PFOS and PFOA are relatively active, and then PFA1, ALT1, one of the alternatives, is also very active, and it's also very active in proliferation assays, endothelial proliferation assays. Um, that's the concentration response for that PFA alt one And these are the end results of the simulations for PFOA, PFOS, and the highly active alternative and a very inactive alternative. This inactive alternative is identical to the control model because it had no activity at all. The PFA alt one has pretty dramatic effects. These are a little hard to see. Um, it took me a while and a lot of explanation, but PFOA is more subtle than PFOS. If you follow along in the control, you can work your way around and there's a continuous or contiguous blood vessel development without interruption. If you follow here in PFOS, that's somewhat true, but there's a thickening, if you will, of the vessels. If you go to PFOA, you can start to get to dead ends. So there's a more severe effect. And if you go to the alternative chemical, there's a lot of dead ends. So you don't have good formation of microvasculature in silico. So we've recapitulated or simulated the phenotype, phenotypic effects of these molecular target chemical interactions based on the ToxCast data. And we get very different effects for different alternatives one to the other. And so we think that these types of approaches might be very useful for making comparisons of one alternative versus another or groups of alternatives versus another and then compare it to the conventional chemicals. Um, this is a low cost, high throughput approach. It's useful for prioritization of green alternative chemicals. And I'm going to repeat again that complementary high throughput exposure predictions are absolutely necessary to move this work forward. Um, in a more useful fashion. So with that, I apologize for the um, confusion about the slides, and I would be happy to take questions if we have time. Okay. Telling me one. One question. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask two, and you just pick the one you like better. I'm sorry, who are you, sir? <laughs> you need to identify yourself. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, you know who I am. You can, that, we, don't, we don't have time. That's all right. Um, the, first, the first is in terms of um, uh, what, are, what are your strategic principles for picking the, the next 10,000? I mean, right now we're in, we're in a pretty limited chemical space. Um, you know, what's, what's the, the next 10,000? Oh yeah, well, gosh. I mean, that's, that's kind of what you had on the. Uh, well, on so the, we've got the, and, and it, I think it'll be published in the next month or so. We have the 10,000 chemical library for Tox21 already purchased, almost completely already plated out going through QC, so that's fixed. It's about 7,000 environmental chemicals, and I don't, it's going to get increasingly difficult to go beyond those 7,000 or so chemicals for a variety of reasons. Where do you get them? Mm -hmm. um, are they stable? Are they soluble in DMSO or some alternative solvent? Ex you know, are they not super volatile, et cetera, et cetera? So yeah. the one th in about a month, we'll have the universe of at-hand testable, high-throughput screening or testable compounds, environmental chemicals. Right. Yeah. I mean, and and uh, the logic is, a, is very, yeah. very, a big collection of things. Yeah. You know, we took input from all over, but you know, to some degree, 
any environmentally relevant chemical that we could get our hands on and that was amenable to high throughput screening is there. Yeah, a parking lot idea might be to, you know, decide what value it would be to really either expand chemical space or, or really parse finely um, particularly active, uh, biologically active parts of chemical space to, to maybe synthesize, but that was... Yeah. So do I have time for my second one or do you want to... Okay. That's oh, all right. You're come on, come on. You're teasing us. So, so the the, the sec well, the second one is, you know, I've been thinking. Uh, I had not been thinking about this from this alternative selection um, perspective. Um, and when you put up your slide about univariate analysis, multivariate analysis, I almost feel like there's a missing part there, which is um, almost a, a Bayesian part where where there's got to be some expert judgment. You know, because when you start thinking about um, uh, the, the chemistry that, that you know that is left out of some of the, um, the high throughput assay data, it almost begs the question that you'd want to weight some of your uh, or the assay biology. results or the uh, differently as well. or inject expert rules. Yeah, um, if, I think one of the better descriptions of it that are in print right now is the Martin et al. reproductive toxicity model paper where there was a fair amount of, there was some expert judgment in how we not only selected features, individual assays, but how they were aggregated. And it was an iterative process to optimize model performance in the training, in the training phase of model development. But that, that partially gets at what your, your point. Thank you, David. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker before lunch is Dr. Russ Naven from uh, Pfizer. Russ is an uh, organic chemist by training and uh, computational toxicologist by his uh, job description. And uh, the committee wanted to have a perspective from uh, drug industry. Again, as this morning we've heard already about you know designing in and out certain features. Clearly, pharma is doing this every day. So some of the, your perspectives on green chemistry and molecular design would be very, very useful. Thank you. Sure. Cheers. Um, I'm actually in the, the Compound Safety Prediction Group at Pfizer, which, is just, which has recently been established um, in the design stages of, the, of drug discovery so that we can inform the, the teams of the safety implications of the drugs they're of their, that they're designing. And so the main focus of, of the talk is basically going to be the development of a compound safety evaluator. Um, this basically gives the, the teams a score of the compounds that they're de designing so they can compare it to series and other compounds um, you know, that, they're, that they're thinking of. So basically, um, safety assessment in, in drug discovery is across um, the discovery process, whether it's from um, post-market surveillance over here all the way back through to hit identification where we carry out a really deep target a knowledge review of the target endpoint. Obviously in these early stages we, we tend to focus on in silico and in vitro toxicology. Um, but basically, traditionally, this hasn't really been um, an area where you can halt the development of a compound. Basically, the positive aims test here would, would be the only safety assay would that would halt the development of a compound. Following from here, we mostly focus on in vivo toxicology studies, but obviously there's a lot more in silico and in vitro work in this area. Um, I could also talk about um, today, but I won't be, the safety of impurities and degradants and, and how we go about identifying risk at this stage once we've identified the main pharmaceutical drug and also of the, of the packaging that the drug comes in and how we, how we look at extractables and any potential risks in there and leachables. But I'm going to focus today on, on this area, the in silico and in vitro. It's at this stage where there is a huge investment in in silico and toxicity screening. So we have tier naught, which is basically a, a paper where we have lots of in silico models. So when a chemist designs a compound and puts it, the virtual compound through our systems, it automatically triggers models. And so they know at this stage whether there is any evidence for any, in, in, any safety considerations at that point. When they've identified um, chemotypes or series that they are interested in, we can then carry out high throughput assays. 
such as the cytotoxicity in mitochondrial assays that can help divert the teams into safer chemical space. It is at this stage where we, we um, including the compound safety evaluator, this is where we can say to the teams, you are, in a, you are more likely to be safe if um, you're more likely to seed with this compound, and here is the evidence. Tier 2, then, once we pass that stage, this is for your, their series which they're focusing on, and we're going for a deeper dive on toxicity mechanisms. So here we'll be looking at lipid metabolism, steroidogenesis, and many other assays that we have coming through. Critically, um, which is often left out um, in discovery projects, is Tier 3, which involves structure activity relationships. This is key if we're going to understand what our assays here and in tier one are actually telling us. It's obviously resource intensive, but it's a critical stage in, identif in identification of the toxic four in your drugs and, and being able to mitigate it. Oops. So to have our op the most optimum um, assessment in this, in this part of the process here, we need to understand our in vivo toxicology. Um, by understanding how our drugs have impact here, we can then further refine our in silico and in vitro models, and also to identify additional in vitro assays to help predict in vivo toxicity. So this first stage of understanding what our in vivo toxicity studies was telling us is key to um, the project. So basically the first stage was to centralise and standardise all the in vitro toxicity data that we had in-house and including the external um, compounds that are out in the literature. So we now have, um, we now have access to Pfizer's acute in vivo toxicology studies which includes 11, 000, more, uh, more than 11,000 compounds. Of all these compounds we have detailed annotations of safety findings at a dose group, at, at the doses used in the, in the tests and also we have toxicokinetic data so we have a good understanding of the safety, the safety implications of these drugs. We also have an attrited compound list, this is basically 800, comp 800 drugs that progressed through, si through Pfizer but, were, um, but were, were dropped due to safety issues so we have a large understanding of these compounds with high levels of annotations as to why they did not go forward. We also have a compound tox list. This is basically 1,600 marketed um, compounds um, that we've screened and tried to find evidence for their, their toxicity. So, for example, if a compound's been told that it's hepatotoxic, we've actually asked, why is this compound been called hepatotoxic? And it's quite surprising to see that many compounds that you see on hepatotoxicity lists, there is actually no evidence in the literature for why they're called hepatotoxic. And they tend to get from... from um, from manuscript to manuscript this tends to feed on and so if we're assessing our assays on a compound that's called hepatotoxic when in fact it isn't then we can see that we don't understand then it's not surprising that the in vitro assays are not predictive of in vivo toxicity we also have a chemogenomics list of 3,000 compounds these are basically target specific and we don't really have any annotations on these, on these compounds but what we found is that if we're going to predict in vivo toxicity, we need to have evidence and clear annotations of the, of the toxicity of these drugs, or else it's not going to work. So basically, we wanted to focus on the compounds that we had the most annotations for, which is the 1,100 1, plus compounds um, at Pfizer. The issues we had was that, obviously, initially, that the, the pathologists who've, um, who've been looking at the safety data obviously just report different findings to different degrees, which is one, one problem. We also, this is also complicated by species, strain, dose, exposure. So this was a, a huge nightmare. We also have a problem of severity. So obviously you can have clinical signs such as just a rise in liver enzymes, or you could have that we had to humanely euthanize the animal owing to the side effects. So obviously severity is a problem. So the solution at first was just to ask ourselves, um, are there any clinical findings at a Cmax um, threshold of 10 micromolar? So basically, um, trying to think of a word. <laughs> so basically, at 10 micromolar, um, 
did we see any toxicity findings? And, and this would include anything from enzyme, liver enzyme rise, um, increases um, to death. And obviously, and then we could rank compounds according to whether they were toxic, clean, or whether they were uncertain. I.e. uncertain is we wasn't sure whether the toxicity occurred below or um, whether the toxicity occurred um, at 10 micromolar or below. So of the 1,136 compounds, this gave us 27.5% um, of compounds that were found to have toxicity findings at 10 micromolar. 21% where we were uncertain, i.e. this means that the, as on the previous stage, that the, the this toxicity, the level, the, the dose at which we saw toxicity, we, we could not decide whether it was below or above 10 micromolar. And then 14.4% 14, 14 that were clean. There were 36% of compounds where we didn't have the dose, any of the dose information. So this is a shame because we were unable to use this data. So in our initial analyses are performed on this 40% of compounds, which are those that we know are toxic below 10 micromolar, and with those that are clean above 10 micromolar. So with this data set at hand, we wanted to ask ourselves, well, what are the origins of, of in vivo toxicity? Obviously, there's the primary pharmacology, which hopefully we've established through the, 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 tar the deep knowledge review. Obviously, we have to worry about off-target and secondary pharmacology. Also, physicochemical properties. So, so for example, lipophilic basic compounds are known to cause phospholipidosis. And also, um, looking at chemical structure. So, is there something about the compound that um, causes SIP inhibition or reactive metabolites? And this is covered by our, our structural alerts within Pfizer. And then we also use the system, Derek. So the first um, area we looked at was physicochemical properties, and this was reported um, several years ago. We found that the, the chance of in vivo toxicity at 10 micromolar was, um, high, was, was strongly linked to physicochemical property space. So if you had a drug um, that had a C log P greater than 3 or a total, and a total polar surface area less than 75, your odds ratio of seeing toxicity at 10 micromolar was, two, was almost two and a half times. So basically, if you compared that to a drug um, that was not in this region, then you were six times more likely to see toxicity in an in, in vitro toxicology study. Sorry, in in vivo toxicology study. So this was critical, and this has become a large part of our, our drive to move drugs out of this physicochemical space. So we also asked ourselves at this point, you know, what biological endpoints can we now add to improve the prediction of in vivo toxicity? So... Obviously, we, showed, we, we know we have a lot of structural alerts and understand the physicochemical properties. We then talk, looked at um, secondary pharmacology. Our first approach was to look at um, the serot profiling. Most of our um, lead compounds go through serot, serot profiling to understand if there is any off-target activity. We were also interested in adding fundamental toxicity assays as well as general toxicity assays that we already have um, at Pfizer. So basically, we, we asked all the safety scientists, could they um, suggest targets or endpoints that they know were assigned with in vivo toxicity or, or, or that they associated with safety findings? And of this, we basically broke this down to 15 serop assays, which we called the promiscuity panel. And this is based on GPCRs, ion channels, transporters, and some phosphodiesterases. Basically, these 15, a this 15 assays gave us a, a quick look at the promiscuity of a compound. And we were able to demonstrate that these 15 assays were actually a very good approximation of all 200 um, assays that you can get at, at Serap. And here's a, um, just a graph to highlight that basically this is our promiscuity panel of 15 assays and how similar it was to the rest of the other Serap assays. So already we've, we've reduced um, the number of assays we need to do for the promiscuity. And here we can demonstrate that this is basically um, how many hits you have across the promiscuity panel. If you have more than two, two or more, then you are six times more likely to see um, toxicity at 10 micromolar in an in vivo toxicology study. So again, this moves on, as well as using physicochemical properties, we can now use promiscuity to identify um, 
whether a compound is going to be pose a sort of safety issues or not. And obviously, it increases as you increase the um, the hitch, you increase your probability of having in vivo toxicity. Our fundamental toxicity assays at the time were being developed, and so we couldn't include them in version one of our compound safety evaluator, but we did have many general toxicity assays, such as the THLE. And at this stage, we wanted to find out you know, what, how, how would we decide which assays were good enough to go into the compound, to go into the evaluator. So in an ideal situation, this is what you would, you would hope to see. So here you have your, your dose at which you see your, the dose at which you see cytotoxicity. And here you have our non-toxic compounds at 10 micromolar and our toxic compounds here. What you'd like to see is that those compounds in an assay that are clean um, are also non-toxic in the 10 micromolar. But also for those compounds that are active in the assay, you also see toxicity. But this is not really what you see. This is comparing an in vitro assay to now an in vivo um, system. What you actually end up seeing is that these compounds will shift, some of these compounds will shift over here because they'll be toxic to the animal for other reasons. And again here, some compounds that you'd expect to be toxic because of how strong they were in the assay will actually be over here because they've been eliminated, detoxified, or there's met metabolism which prevents you, um, which oh, I can't remember the word. <laughs> um, Yeah, okay. <laughs> the amount of compound that the animal sees. Does anyone know the word? <laughs> it's out of my mind. Pardon? That, um, oh, it'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah, it's similar. Oh, anyway. So basically, we wanted to select those assays with the highest odds ratio. So we were looking down here. So if we had toxicity in the assay, um, how great, how which is all compounds below there, what was the chance of you being in toxic in vivo? But also we need to check that we, weren't, we would minimise mechanistic overlap. There's no use having two cytotoxicity assays that are telling you the same thing. Um, so basically then, knowing we have all these, these variables to, that highlight toxicity, we wanted to combine these variables. So this is an example of how we, uh, to demonstrate this. So if you're looking at physicochemical properties, if you're in the, um, the, the dodgy physicochemical space, then you're 11.2 times, this is on a, new, on a different data set, you're 11.2 times more likely to see toxicity at 10 micromolar. If you then to add a promiscuity, um, as well as looking at physicochemical properties, then you're 13.6 times more likely to see toxicity. Notice, however, that the sensitivity goes down because um, there are compound, the number of compounds that are in bad space, both for promiscuity and physical chemical property, become less. So if you now add a mechanistic assay, which is apoptosis, then this goes up to 19.6 times your chance of being toxic at 10 micromolar. And then adding a cytotoxicity assay, 26.7 times more likely to see toxicity. So this is a really powerful way of using in vitro assays to, to identify probabilistically whether you are, not, you are going to be caused toxicity in vivo. So the compound safety evaluator, we wanted to derive just a single score um, of this toxicity at 10 micromolar to allow a comparison of compounds and series and so that the teams could see within their series and their compounds which ones they should be going with to give them more confidence. So we wanted to make use of each variable so we needed a multi-parameter optimization approach. Basically they get the score from 0 to 1 with each variable having um, a contribution to the score. At this point, we chose 35 discrete endpoints, which includes all the serot binding assays, all 15, the in vitro cytotoxicity assay, THLE. We did include at the time genetic toxicity assays and also defetoli binding and HERG to try and predict for cardiotoxicity. We also in included um, knowledge on physicochemical properties and basic, basic PKO. This is quite complex for me. <laughs> but anyway, the scoring methodology goes um, sort of like this. If we, so if you were looking at C log P, um, if your chemical had a C log P of four or more, 
um, then it con his contribution to the score would be 0 0.5 in the sense that it would drag the score down. So you'd now go from 1 to 0 0.5. But obviously, each variable has its own weighting and contribution to the MPO. For cytotoxicity, um, obviously, at 0.1, it would have a greater impact if you were cytotoxic at less than 10 micromole in the vitro assay. So all these um, variables were weighted to try and give the maximum um, spread for the data set. So this was the first version of the model to come through. These are all the clean compounds and the score on the, on the side. So this goes from 0 0.6, 0 0.75 to 1. And these are the toxic compounds here. What we were happy to see is that the, of the clean compounds, there was only one in this compound here at 0.75 or below. Whereas for, the, for, for those toxic compounds, there were 38 at 0.75 or below. This was a significant, finding, well, significant results for us because this demonstrated um, how successful the approach could be. But also, if we were to have this before, we carried, before the in vivo studies were um, planned, we could have saved approximately $4 million, pound, $4 million of, of resources by not carrying out these, these in, vitro, in vivo studies. Obviously, 38 um, isn't that much compared to the 100 or so that the false negatives that we do have. And that's what we've been spending most of our time on over the past few years to try and understand the, the toxicological space that we need to drag these compounds down into this area, but not to, but to leave these compounds here. We carried out an external evaluation of the, the, the CSC version 1 using all the oral drugs that um, have been launched since 1990. We filtered biomethylator 600 to remove the large biologics. And we had to ensure that we had the CEREP data, obviously, so they could fill, so you could get the CSC score. This gave us 156 launch drugs for analysis. And this is the snapshot. Um, we wanted to, we wanted to um, differentiate the compounds compared to dose, because obviously the low dose you have, then the, the, more, the more flexible you can be with the safety properties of the compounds. But of those compounds of 500 mg or more daily dose, then most of them had a high CSE score. Looking those at those at the 50 mg or less, again, most of the compounds did have a high CSE score, but obviously we you can have more flexibility when you're down at these doses. So this is quite, this was uh, very exciting for us. So this is what, at the time, the teams would see if they submitted a compound. Um, this is an example of peroxetine. Um, they would have their score here and their phys physical chemical property space. They'd have their pharmacological assays highlighting where the, you know, the assays that were that contributing to the score that they had. Um, we had our own structural alerts here as well as Derek, and the cytotoxicity assays here. Obviously, no genetic toxicity for this compound at the time. And obviously, we also gave them. Um, the project team's natural form um, for them of all the compounds um, that they submitted at the time so they could see the range of values for each chemotype and series within the, sub the compounds that they submitted. So basically we, only need to, we need to look about improving sensitivity because we're only identifying 22% of the toxic compounds. We recognise that the score was dominated by the off-target pharmacology of the CERA panels. We also required more mechanistic-based safety endpoints. And we also wanted to refine the variable weightings because they had just been basically chosen from, from experience rather than being done computationally to understand their, their impact. But we wanted to be, be cautious because we didn't, because the data set, although it was small at about 300 or 400 compounds, we didn't want to excessively validate the process because then you, 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 you may lead to overfitting of the of the training set. So basically we simplified the promiscuity assessment. So we reduced 15 assays to one variable. So these are just two examples of hit rate. And as you can see, this demonstrates how, how good um, the promiscuity assessment is at, at dragging down compounds that are more toxic. Partition index is just another um, way of looking at hit rate. I think this is the one that we eventually went with. 
we then looked at, at many um, variables now to try and understand which, which variable had the most importance towards contributing to the identification of 10 micromolar toxicity. Um, so we looked at different assays with different cell lines, and we can see that some cell lines were better than others at predicting the toxicity. Also, we found that there were, rather than just looking at polar surface area and C log P, if you were to look at fractional polar surface area, this was an amazing um, impact on whether a compound would be toxic or not. Um, there were some mitochondrial assays down here, which we were surprised did not have an impact on in vivo, tox on in vivo toxicity. And this is not surprising to us because... In vivo, if you have mitochondrial toxicity, many cells and organs can actually compensate for the mitochondrial toxicity because they can, they can create ATP through glycolysis. And so this, although this is not, is not, does not correlate to in vivo toxicity, it actually correlates to market, to withdrawal of drugs from the market because it's at that stage when you have, you have people with genetic variations in their mitochondrial DNA. And it's those who then will then suffer from the impacts of mitochondrial dysfunction. This is the same show we've actually looked at correlating variables to understand which ones were overlapping more overlapping. And this was compound, this is the results of compound safety valor version two. And this now included some um, mechanistic assays. As you can see, we've now dragged down a lot more of these compounds into this area. But we've obviously still got a long way to go. Okay, we, we, we know we're, we're increasing our false positive rate, but the amount of compounds that we have in this area now is, um, is, really, is really helpful. Our next step is, is how can we incorporate dose or potency with, within the whole system? So here's two examples of lamogatrine. Lamo oh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. It has a CSC, CSC score of 0.88, which is fine, so of low risk, and paroxetine, also of low risk, but it has a CSC version of 0.2. Again, we notice here that it's dose. This is 100 to 500, relatively safe, but this is 50 mg. So it can, because of the low dose, you have more flexibility in the safety profile. We're obviously addressing false negative space. We're exploring novel mechanisms of toxicity, such as steroidogenesis um, and, and other, and other pr um, promoter assays. And obviously... Um, as we develop new assays, it's more, you have to ask yourself, what is the assay telling you, not just is it predictive of in vivo toxicity? And we're obviously looking at severity because clearly this does include severity. Does a drug just cause mild liver increases or does it cause death? So that's just demonstrating that. We've also created in silico CSC now, and this is, um, so we can take this back earlier into drug discovery. So this is a calculated CSC of 80 compounds that were registered before synthesis and obviously very good correlation, which is quite helpful. So in summary, um, you know, we've, def we've deployed a de predictive platform which can predict around 6% of compounds which cause low-dose toxicity. This has guided medicinal chemistry in over 70 projects um, at Pfizer. And it's, and it's been quite interesting to try and... Um, you know, to initiate safety considerations along to, uh, at this stage with their potency and with their ADMI properties that they're looking at. It's also a framework for evaluating how good is an assay. What's the point developing an assay that you don't understand, you know, that it, what it does? Um, and obviously, we're trying to improve the, um, the tool from, from dose and severity. But the good news is this is, this is having... Um, effects on being able to steer medicinal chemistry out of bad, out of bad toxicological space and into, fa into space where they can be more, hap more confident that, that their drug will be safe, um, will we'll succeed. And there's just many people I'd like to thank for listening, for yourself for listening. We'll have time for a couple of questions. Uh, let me start by asking a question. One of your last slides, you had a uh, measured versus predicted. So predicted was done way before you actually done any assays or before you synthesized the compound. So what's yep. the prediction here? Because your uh, CSC actually requires both biological in vitro assays and a little bit of understanding of physical chemical properties, right? 
yeah, so we, we, we've actually created models of all um, for, we've all created models of all these assays. So you're trying to predict in vitro activity of the compound yes. using structure? Yes, using structure. Okay. And so then that's been used to create the CSE score, which was very similar when we got actually all the results through. So are you saying then you don't need to run any in vitro assays? <laughs> um, I'd actually like to say that because um, the actual good correlation may be down to physical chemical property space. Uh, Pete Myers, Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, thanks for a wide-ranging overview of how you guys go about what you do. It's really interesting. One of your graphs, if I didn't misinterpret, uh, seemed to make it very explicit the, that you assume monotonicity in the dose-response curve. Yeah. Yeah. Um, virtually all natural hormones, lots of pharmaceutical hormones, and many endocrine-disrupting compounds that... Uh, have been studied for this effect show non-monotonic dose response curves where the, uh, the mechanism of toxicity is very different at one range of dose compared to another range. As an example, um, tamoxifen, cytotoxic, high doses, that's why it does good things by killing off tumor cells. At a thousand-fold beneath the NOEL identified in traditional testing, a thousand-fold beneath it, uh, it's estrogenic and promotes breast cancer growth. Um, at the level that's actually predicted by standard testing to be safe, to be the, the reference dose. Um, from a perspective of work on endocrine-disrupting compounds and designing against them, this is one of the central issues that green chemists are going to need to face, that they have to look at, over a, at, at uh, multiple mechanisms of toxicity over a wide range of doses to pick up non-monotonicity. Yep. Have you guys begun to think about how you're going to factor that endocrinological reality into your work, or are you just going to ignore it? <laughs> I think at this stage of the, because of the early stages that we're at, at the drug discovery process, that we're focusing more on the, the fundamental mechanisms of toxicity. Um, obviously, if there is a yet we to identify false negative space we're now looking at a causal reasoning en engine which analyzes um, gene expression and obic data to then to which is then let, which is then informing us of the, perhaps the assays that we should be including in this model so we have lots of hypotheses of hypotheses that of, that of um, targets that may be causing toxicity Bill Farrell in Colorado State Russ, nice talk. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the use of the 10 micromolar threshold uh, as a, an indicator for these assays? <clears throat> this was basically chosen. I did have a slide, but I've taken it out. Is it, oh no, is it still there? No. This was basically a retrospect analysis of um, how much you, um, I can show you. I'll show you a slide. <laughs> it's actually a, a six-point process where they asked what, what is generally what, uh, what exposure do you need to cause a toxic effect and then they've taken this back which can came to 10 micromolar it is, an ab ab it is an arbitrary point at the moment it was the same one used for all of the assets yes obviously if you're looking at um, for some of our kinase projects who are active who know they're going to be toxic at 10 micromolar regardless then obviously we have problems with, with, with those project teams. They're saying this is not good for us because we know we're going to be toxic. Can you lower the, 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 the threshold? So we're investigating that. Alex Trop, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I was somewhat puzzled by a comment about overvalidation. Yeah. The question I know, can you expand on this? And uh, specifically the models that you were showing? Well, they obtained with some sort of cross-validation or independent validation? What, what do you mean specifically? I mean in the sense um, that if all our focus is to, to, tr to use our assays to drag these compounds down, we were only looking at a small section of, of computational space. So a cytotoxicity assay, for example, may be really, um, may be really useful. We're just not testing it in the right, physical chem the right chemical space. So, for example, if we had a, st a steroidogenesis assay, we may not have been testing any, any um, steroid um, impacting compounds. Does that mean we don't include the assay in, this, in the evaluator? It's in a sense that we realize we're testing on small, um, 
you know, small pharmacological space and that we don't necessarily dismiss an assay just because it doesn't show predictivity against um, the data set. Quick question. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris Volpe from UC Berkeley. Um, so we've heard um, about several um, really good uh, systems and models and for looking at toxicity being developed independently by different companies. And I was wondering, is there any consideration in uh, industry to make some of the toxicity uh, data public so that uh, everyone can work on a perhaps one model? Because in some ways, each of you are sort of rediscovering the wheel over and over again, and you're coming up with really useful methods, but it seems like there would be a real utility to combine the information that these individual companies have on toxicity in terms of proprietary toxicity data, making that data available so that not only can your individual uh, people work on it, but the community at large uh, could also uh, perhaps contribute to this, this effort. Sure, I mean, hopefully we, we will be, hopefully we'll, we'll, we will um, publish some manuscripts um, on, on the work, but well, obviously we need, we need to sack the lawyers, that's my, <laughs> sorry, that's my, uh, my thoughts, but obviously we'd like to, but obviously it's, it's IP and so we, we can try and, re um, we can try and publish as much as we can. Well, thank you, Russ, and let's thank all the uh, morning speakers.